Hello, everyone. My name is Sabrina Osmani. I'm a PhD student at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Is privacy a necessary myth? In conversation today, we have Kate Crawford, Principal Researcher at Microsoft Research, Visiting Professor at MIT Center for Civic Media, and Senior Fellow at New York University's Information Law Institute. Kate's research focuses on the social impact of media technologies, particularly those that collect large sets of data from their users. Her 2006 book, Adult Themes, Rewriting the Rules of Adulthood, won the individual category of the Manning Clark National Cultural Award, and in 2008, Kate was honored with the award for outstanding scholarship from the Australian Academy of the Humanities. She is currently working on a new book on data and power. Professor Uday Singh Mehta, Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the Graduate Center at City University, New York, is a renowned political theorist whose work ranges on issues uh, regarding the relationship between freedom and imagination, liberalism's complex link with colonialism, and more recently, war, peace, and nonviolence. He's the author of Anxiety of Freedom, Imagination and Individuality in Liberalism and Empire, which won the Greenstone Book Award from the American Political Science Association in 2001 for the best book in history and theory category. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kay Crawford. So good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to say it's such a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank Roger for inviting me and for everybody at the Hannah Arendt Center for making this conference happen. So my name is Kate Crawford, and I research the social, ethical, and political context of what we now call big data. And what that's meant is that I've looked at everything from state surveillance uh, through to biometrics through to how we understand things like the smart city. And if there's something that's really kind of still continues to amaze me over 10 years of researching these topics, it's just how far the techniques of big data have spread into both the public and private sectors. It has been, in many ways, an extraordinary turn to data. And what I'd like to suggest today is that I think the privacy challenges that are presented by this turn to data are unlike anything we've faced before. And they're not just different by a matter of scale, but I think they're actually qualitatively different to the challenges that we've had in the past. I'm going to take a moment just for a very quick definition, because this term big data, not a big fan, I have to say. It's, uh, let's face it, completely overhyped, and it's such a general term as to be almost completely meaningless. But back in 2011, uh, Dana Boyd and I co-wrote a paper where we tried to define what big data is. And we thought about it not just in terms of the technicalities and its capacities in analytics, both of which are changing every week, but as a mythology. As a mythology that the more data we have, somehow the more objectivity and truth and accuracy we possess. And it's this mythology that I think is actually very important here, because it, it points to me that what we're looking at is an epistemo basically an epistemological shift, as much as one that is technical or in other ways methodological. It's about how we define the very nature of knowledge. And I think in this sense, it's coming right up against the limitations of the 20th century understanding of this very individual right discourse where we've understood privacy. So what I'm going to do today is just quickly walk you through some of the research that I've been doing over the last few years and to try and consider some of these limitations of privacy. Now, this is not to critique privacy so much as to provoke us as to how we might do more with this idea and what new concepts we need to bring to bear to deal with these new technological capacities. Beyond privacy, I would like to suggest we need an ethics of data in order to contend with things like discrimination, inequity, and exploitation. So to begin, I'm going to take us back far, far back, back to 1650. This is an extraordinary invention that was called the talking statue. And it was developed by a man, Anathias Kircher, who was a pretty extraordinary Jesuit polymath. He invented the first magnetic clock, uh, various automatons, sort of early robots, and the megaphone. And back in 1650, he developed this talking statue, which is 
basically a microphone. And what it would do is a huge spiral tube that would connect to this statue, and he would polish the inner surface of that tube to such a fine point that it would reflect the waveforms perfectly. So it would convey the sound from the crowded piazza below, where you'd have people sharing secrets and discussing politics of the day, so it would be piped directly up into the private chambers of an Italian aristocrat who's listening next to his statue. And what I love about this is that it, it for some, some ways, captures, I think, exactly where we are now. It was always meant as a type of elite magic. This surveillance was the sort of thing that only people with enormous power and wealth could ever have access to. And, of course, they were never supposed to reveal the working of the magic trick. So if you were in the piazza, you would never know that if you were having a private conversation, it was being piped upstairs. But what we can see here is that there's already this quite dramatic distinction in who does the surveillance. So listening systems, even at this very early stage, are about power, class, and invisibility. And I would suggest that they remain so to this day. Let me give you a much more contemporary example. Meet Hello Barbie. Now, some of you might know that Hello Barbie is just about to be released onto the market, and she's a little different to the previous Barbies that you might have known. This Barbie will be listening to the voices of her children and recording them and then responding to them. Uh, at the back end of this extraordinary system is a uh, data processing and analysis system developed by Toy Talk. But what is extraordinary about it, of course, is that in some ways this is like Kirsch's talking statue, except the data flow has been reversed. The sound is being taken from the private domestic space and then shared out into this piazza full of data scientists and engineers who will be analyzing all of these recordings of children. Now, of course, Barbie is designed to elicit empathetic emotional responses from us. She's got this winsome smile and she'll have very sort of witty repartee. And of course, the idea is that she will get to know your children very well through this exchange and will be able to increasingly tailor what she's going to be saying to them. And of course, the fear of many parents is that increasingly market towards those specific individual children. Now, many of these kinds of devices already exist. Samsung was slapped on the wrist when they tried to release a TV that listens to your living room. We've got intelligent agents like Siri and Cortana. And of course, now Amazon has released a product called Echo, which will sit in your living room or your bedroom. And you can issue it instructions like search queries, and it will talk back to you. And of course, this one, which I particularly love, which is Google's patent on creepy toys that will both be videoing you through their eyes and listening to you through their big fuzzy ears. <laughs> Pretty appealing. What is different here then to Kirsch's listening statue? Well, I think they're different because, first of all, these are for a mass market. They will be affecting far more people than we would see in a single piazza. But more than this, I think it's because of their ability to aggregate, analyze, cross-reference, and search this data over time. This data, in some cases, can be held indefinitely, and that presents a whole range of difficulties for those children when they grow up into adults. Now, earlier this year, a colleague of mine, Katie London, and I organized a summit on listening machines, where we brought together the, the designers of these kinds of systems, along with philosophers and technology critics and artists. And I want to share with you one of the most extraordinary exchanges that I saw during this summit, which was with one of the designers of Chibo, which is this robot that you see here. Now, Chibo is called the world's first social robot for the home. And basically, Chibo is permanently tracking everybody in the house. It can video you, it can record you, it can give you helpful information. It'll let you know what's on your calendar that day and what the weather is like. It's basically somewhere between a pet and a personal assistant, and it's incredibly cute. And effectively, Jibo is designed to blend in with the family. But there's a problem here. Jibo is so cute and such an affective, appealing affective robot, you will automatically sense a kind of trust and compatibility with this machine. But you might want to ask yourself, who does Jibo obey? Now, in the first instance, just in the context of the home, Chibo is most likely bought by a parent. So for the children who are also coming to trust and engage with Chibo from a very early age, if they're caught having an extra 
chocolate cookie when they're not meant to, or if it's the teenager sneaking a sip of brandy from the cupboard, this also gets reported back to the parent. So this relationship of trust actually gets very complicated because a system that was designed to work for you will also begin to work against you. We also might think about the fact that Jibo must also report this information back to Jibo Corp. And then at the third possible level of extension, we could think about the kinds of uh, things that we know now about the NSA and their desire to, in many ways, undercut the encryption of consumer technologies. This could very easily be an agent that then reports you to the state. So I think what's interesting here is that the previous norms around how we understand privacy just don't contend very well with these technologies. These technologies sit within the home. We carry them on our bodies. And in some cases, like Jibo and Hello Barbie, they have faces and they have voices. We begin to connect to them, to trust them, to relate to them emotionally. But we're also allowing them this extraordinary ability to harvest our most personal details. Also, people are electing to have these devices in their homes. We're voluntarily parting with this information every day. So privacy in its 20th century formulation simply doesn't take us very far here. But let's talk about a different type of data. I was glad to see that somebody's already asked a question today about what's happening with the Fitbit. Uh, we've seen a whole explosion in different wearable technologies. And these technologies can be used to track your exercise, your caloric intake, your sleep, the brand new ones are actually also tracking your pulse and your galvanic skin response. So that means they're looking at your physiological and emotional arousal in a very similar way that, say, a lie detector would do, except now you're wearing a polygraph on your wrist. And what is interesting about this, of course, is that this kind of data can be very powerful. It can drive you to exercise more, to eat better, to change your patterns of living. But something else happens when you put one of these on your wrist, which is that you no longer become the most authoritative source of data about yourself. You have split a data stream between your recollection and understanding and the one that's being recorded by the device. And this can actually have some very serious ramifications. Now, in a paper with uh, Jessa Lingle and Tara Carpi, we looked at some of these ramifications, and I was glad to see someone raise the, the issue of health insurance. We know now that John Hancock is the first US health insurer that has offered a discount, 9 to 12%, if you are prepared to part with all of your Fitbit data and put an app on your phone that will track you 24-7 and will report how long you spend at the gym, for example. The other thing that is also happening with this data that I think is quite interesting and somewhat concerning is that this is the first year where we've seen Fitbit data in the courtroom. So this was in the case of a personal injury trial where somebody used this data to show that their activities had in fact lessened. But think about the potential of how that data could be used in criminal cases to determine where you've been at particular times of day or how much activity you were engaged in. This gets particularly sticky when we realise that some of this technology is still not quite perfect. Um, and so we've got the unfit bits, the fact that you can actually attach these to, say, a metronome, and you can essentially hack the data yourself. So it's interesting that we see these as so objective when, in many ways, they're still quite partial and imperfect technologies. The other thing I want to quickly talk about is civic spaces that surveil us. And one that you may not have heard about yet, which is, of course, in church, this is something that I thought was quite interesting that we've found out only quite recently about a company called Face6 that produces a uh, facial uh, recognition system which is installed in churches around the world. And what it does is it tracks who's coming to church, who's not attending, who you should be checking up on. Uh, this may seem concerning enough, but the part that is really bothersome, of course, is that, as has been confessed by the CEO of Face6, most churches don't let people know that they have this facial recognition system installed. So even when you turn up, you're completely unaware that you're being tracked in these ways. At the moment, we just don't have any federal laws that govern the use of this type of facial recognition technology. So it effectively falls outside of most of the privacy frameworks in the US. And the Department of Commerce recently had a set of uh, stakeholder meetings with both NGOs and privacy organizations along with the technology industry, which collapsed when they simply couldn't come to any agreements with industry about when consent would be a relevant 
issue when using facial recognition technology. So we could also ask about how this is happening in our city streets. This is a brand new system that you can see up here that General Electric is just about to conduct a trial in New York City. This is an intelligent street light that has multi-directional cameras that are recording all the time and also a range of sensors. So it's recording pedestrians, traffic, you name it. Uh, and I think what's interesting about this is that it's not particularly special. But it is one of hundreds, nay thousands, of smart city technologies that are being deployed in cities around the world, essentially to gather as much data as possible, ostensibly to address issues like safety and traffic congestion, etc. But what this also is, is a very significant shift towards big data-driven cities. And it's not clear to me what sense of ethics or democracy should accompany this. And here I'm thinking of a very disturbing incident that happened uh, last year in the Ukraine where people who attended a peaceful protest all received the same text message, which said that you have been registered as a participant in an illegal protest. So the fact that even in these spaces of streets where we commonly associate forms of civic dissent and public protest are actually profoundly surveilled spaces. So the epistemological basis here, I would suggest, is as clear as it is suspect. If knowledge and power are defined as always having more data, and if more data necessarily means greater safety and efficiency, then we have effectively agreed to a type of big data fundamentalism. This is ultimately a regime of endless measurement, a kind of philosophy of collect it all, driven by this desire to unearth all hidden thoughts and corners. So as a set of challenges, I think this exceeds privacy rights as they were imagined 120 years ago by Warren and Brandeis when they wrote The Right to Privacy. Over a century of legal scholarship has focused on this kind of textualist effort to understand the term of what is the right to be left alone and, and how are we to interpret the Fourth Amendment. But it's really focused on these metaphors of one-to-one -one communication and, and a secret vault of documents. And I just think these are the wrong metaphors for the types of technologies that I've been showing you today. I think we also have to remember here that Brandeis himself was a member of a very particular political and economic elite. So for him, being photographed in public was a loss of his entitlements, a type of subversion of his status. So the response of the elite then was always to build up these type of legal and technological barriers to prevent this kind of appropriation. So we could think about tinted windows, we could think about private garages, or even encryption. And as much as I love encryption, and I encourage its use and use it myself, to date we can think about it as another elite response to an elite conceptualization of privacy. It really hasn't addressed the mass issues that we're having with the way that our electronic communications are being intercepted. So what I would suggest instead is that we need a far broader change to shift the frame away from privacy in its 20th century formulation to ethics. Now, this is not to reject the importance of privacy per se, but simply to think of a frame where we can consider the full implications of who is most harmed by these kinds of tracking technologies. And what we've been finding in our research, and certainly history is testament to this, is that it's not generally the white, the wealthy, and the privileged. It's generally communities of color, it's low-income communities, and it's the already marginalized who have the most to fear from these technologies. So by asking about the ethics of data collection, I think we can move beyond simply thinking about privacy to ask what democratic implications are actually in sway while these, while these changes are happening. And just for starters, I think we should start considering things like data ethics courses being embedded in computer science and engineering. And we should certainly be updating the ethics codes of the ACM, uh, currently the peak body for computer scientists. Their ethics code, by the way, 23 years old. Quite a lot has happened since then. So the provocation I'd like to end on today is this. Given the cocktail of technologies that become exponentially more powerful when they're being used in combination, and given the current lack of regulations that contend with this full range of potential harms, what kind of paths forward do we think are actually productive now? What collective frameworks of responsibility, of accountability, and of care can we develop if privacy is not enough? Thank you. Can I 
Chateis. Uh, I want to start by thanking Roger and Bard and the Ren Center. Uh, Roger has a remarkable capacity for organizing what I think are the most interesting conferences I attend. And I've attended a number of these conferences. Uh, he's also, as an aside, uh, uh, recently converted me to be a Mets fan. Uh, <laughs> but as yet, I must be the most ignorant Mets fan because I barely know the rules of the game. But any case, I owe a long-standing debt to Roger. What I'm going to speak on is uh, slightly different than much of what you've heard today, and it's simply because uh, I'm differently trained. I don't work on privacy. Uh, I'm a kind of run-of-the-mill political theorist. And so I want to start... Uh, by giving you a, a, a kind of picture uh, in which privacy becomes important. Uh, and it becomes important as a right. It seems to me one of the kind of transcendent values of modern political theory, and this was not true of ancient political theory, uh, is the importance of security. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, who many people think of as a kind of founding figure of modern political thought, uh, uh, made it quite clear, and very few uh, political thinkers since then have dissented on this point, that uh, uh, the unity of the state and the security of the state uh, is a kind of transcendent value. Okay. Um, so when, when Hobbes said, salus populi suprema lex esto, he meant that is the, the safety of the people is the supreme law. He meant salus as safety, not as it had been typically understood, which was as salvation. So the safety of the republic or the, of the polity uh, was this kind of founding value. Now the reason I think it's important to, re to keep this in mind is that um, <coughs> other rights that emerge emerge in conjunction or in response to this transcendent value of security, security of the state and the security of the individuals. The result of this claim that other rights emerge in response to this fundamental uh, right of security or, or, or value of security is that one ends up uh, in a situation where things like privacy have to be balanced with other things, like security. And that is typically how the conversation about privacy rights goes. So that you have this desire for security, security against terrorists, security against uh, foreign powers, sec security against your neighbors, uh, and that has to kind of balance, in some sense, with the kind of right to privacy, just like other rights have to be balanced. You know, First Amendment rights have to be balanced, etc. And so you have this kind of uh, balancing act always in play. And what it produces is a kind of politics of cost and benefit. And security is one element in that calculus. And I want to call it a politics of cost and benefit because I want to set this off with something else 
which I will call an ethics of privacy. So in this calculus of cost and benefit, security on one side, privacy on the other, we have a situation where lines have to be drawn. And typically, lawyers are very important in drawing those lines. And not for a minute do I want to suggest that the drawing of those lines is unimportant. Okay? I think it is very important, actually. So the line can be drawn in things like privacy refers to not being observed or the right to be left alone, um, uh, Brandeis's claim. Uh, and, you know, one can extend it as indeed it is constantly being extended. Now, what I want to do uh, is ask the following question. What might privacy look like if one was not operating in a conceptual domain in which security of the state and the security of individual lives was a transcendent value. What if one said, look, you know, that's not the starting point of the game. Okay. That we are giving up or we are playing, to put it in Wittgensteinian terms, a different language game in which we don't think of security as being this kind of primary value. What might privacy look like under those conditions? And the figure who, it seems to me, most allows us to engage this thought, this thought of what might privacy look like if we weren't giving a certain primary significance to security is the person who I know something about is Gandhi. So Gandhi has this idea of we should give up on this notion of security. And many attendant and related notions. So he's, he's not at all concerned with the unity of the state or the unity of the nation. He doesn't care about things like borders. Okay? He doesn't care about things like being safe. He values courage much more than safety. Now, I want to think about how might somebody like Gandhi have thought about privacy, given that he doesn't care about this notion of security. Now, it seems to me here we are in a very different array once we give up on this notion of security. So here are some of the things Gandhi doesn't object to. Or he, he believes firmly that states should not have any secrets. He believes there's nothing wrong in people walking into his bedroom and seeing him lying there naked with his two young nieces. He believes there was no reason for anybody to knock on his door before entering. This might suggest that Gandhi just didn't value privacy. I think that's wrong. What he didn't value was privacy understood as a right. Because he saw that right as just one among other rights which the state gave you or didn't give you or gave you partially and it had to barter it off, as I said, it had to balance it with other rights. So Gandhi doesn't have this notion of a right to privacy. But does he have any notion of privacy? Now, Roger uh, invoked a rents uh, idea, very important idea, that in some sense what was important about 
The right to privacy was that it made possible an inner life. It gave depth to life. Gandhi certainly believed in that inner life. He certainly believed in the importance on life having an internal depth. But for him, that depth did not turn on not being observed. For him, it didn't matter in some sense to his inner life whether he was being observed or not. So, famously, in the beginning, or towards the very beginning, in the second paragraph, I think, of his autobiography, uh, Gandhi says, there are some things that are only between me and my creator. Those clearly cannot be communicated. And those are the things that, value the, that, that he values the most, his inner life. But he would never think of seeking protection for those aspects of his inner life through a, by, by wagering a claim against the state on, on grounds of the right of privacy. So, as I said, Gandhi was prepared to give up on security. In giving up on security, he felt he was not giving up on privacy. Gandhi also didn't think that privacy was associated with intimacy in the ways we typically think of it as being associated with intimacy. We think of it as being associated with intimacy as a domain which is somehow violated by the presence of others or the eyes of others or by surveillance. Gandhi's conception of intimacy was completely different. It did not turn on this occlusion. It did not, in that sense, turn on being in a dark space or a darkened space. It turned, in many ways, on something altogether different. The inner life was the life of self-searching. It was, in this sense, much, much more Socratic. The inner life was about understanding oneself, knowing oneself. And that concern with privacy, which I am identifying as a concern with privacy that is not linked to the right of privacy, it seems to me is altogether different then, in some sense, what we are talking about. Because what we are talking about is implicitly and quite often very explicitly tied to a right that one has because one also wants something and principally one wants a certain kind of security from the state. And the state can always say something like, because you want that security, you have to give up on something else. And that something else that you give up on is often privacy. Gandhi didn't, as it were, abide this calculus. His is not a politics of negotiating between different rights. It seems to me it's better to think of it as a kind of ethics of the self, which deeply cherishes privacy, but in which that concern with privacy cannot ever be relegated to something one gets from the state. Thank you. Thank you, Kate and Ode. That was fantastic and very, very insightful, very different, but uh, 
I think we have a lot to talk about. Um, Kate, I wanted to ask you first. So you briefly touched on this idea of like an ethics for data, and you and you spoke about home devices and uh, the increasing uh, the, the increasing. Uh, speed at which we're bringing uh, interactive devices into our homes that are learning our behaviors um, and, and are, in a certain sense, optimizing our behaviors towards certain goals, Fitbits, um, or, uh, as you said, Barbies that will um, learn your behavior, learn how to interact with you better, or um, robots that will make sure that kids are behaving well. Um, what do you think the, the ethics question applies to here? Like, are, are you... Are you thinking about the designers of these uh, devices? Uh, should they be held to a certain standard, ethical standard? Well, let me give you a pragmatic answer and then a more philosophical answer. I think at the pragmatic level, there is an enormous gap, this dearth of thinking around the ethics of how all of this data is going to be collected and used. So we have traditionally relied on these sort of legal paradigms, which Udoi has beautifully outlined around security and privacy. We haven't been so good in thinking about what are the ethics of these systems that we design, of the data that we collect? What is our responsibility to the people who have given us that data? The pragmatic answer to this is that I think there are some very concrete steps we can take. At the moment, we are seeing the birth of a new discipline. That discipline is called data science. Uh, we're seeing a whole host of universities uh, set up new data science degrees and institutes. What we're not seeing necessarily along with that is a vision of what ethics will be. How do we actually train people in an ethical paradigm around how they use that data? That's something that I think we can work on, we can actually address. I mentioned the ACM, uh, both the ACM and the IEEE, the peak bodies for computing and engineering, uh, have codes of ethics, but they're both over 20 years old. So that is another very pragmatic thing I think we can do to have a kind of framework for the ethics of how data is being retained and used. But I would like to turn more to this philosophical question, certainly in response uh, to Uday's provocations around Gandhi. And I think about this in relation to this idea of what is the ethics of the self here? Now, in the research paper that we did looking specifically at wearables, what we found really quite stark in the way these things are advertised and marketed is that they're meant to give you self-knowledge that by having a wearable that tracks your pulse and your exercise and your sleep, that you will know yourself better. And that's a pretty big claim. And I think what's interesting about that is, does that data actually represent you? It's an attractive notion that somehow by exteriorizing our data that we will know ourselves better. But I think we actually have to question that. And instead, we have to come to a, a sense of, you know, what is this idea of self-knowledge that is separate from mass data collection, because at the moment, I think those two things are being subsumed in really problematic ways. Thank you. Um, well, to follow up with that, what do you think about, um, so on, on the one hand, we have very specific systems that you know, collect the data and that data is uh, used to analyze your behavior. But what about if we take that argument to the extreme and we have systems that uh, not only understand you but uh, recommend things that you do based on um, not value systems that are programmed into it necessarily but values that it automatically learns over time. Uh, what does that say about um, uh, self-direction rather than just self-identity? Well, here's where it gets really interesting very quickly, which is, what if these systems start to know us better than we know ourselves? What if we think about the kinds of, I mean, certainly in my case, the kinds of range of questions that I've put into search engines over the last 10 years of my life as being an extraordinary kind of account of the thoughts and concerns that I've had as an individual that really represent something very deep about me. There, there was a great line that a Google engineer used once, which was that, you know, we know what you're thinking and wanting about two days before you do. And I think there's something in that, that we've created almost these 21st century oracles that we give our most intimate thoughts to. And again, I was thinking again of Uday's sort of referencing of Gandhi and, and his, his interactions with his creator, that very intimate sense of exchanges, of questions, of, of how we pose the things that mean the most to us. For many people, particularly those people who are secular, that's happening in these environments, in these enormous data collection environments that then, in their own way, have this very intimate knowledge, very detailed sense of who we are. Now that goes beyond a sense of 
privacy of keeping things to ourselves because in many ways we can't even see this incredibly detailed picture of ourselves because it's been so externalized over such a long period of time. So there are some really interesting questions we can ask when you start laying particular kinds of predictive analytics over that that say, well, we kind of know what Kate's been thinking and doing for the last 10 years. We know when she's sick. We know when she's traveling. We can, we can start to make some pretty insightful predictions about what she's going to do next. So then we're actually creating systems that not only have this ability to be time machines in the way that Ben Wisner referred to the NSA's data collection that go backwards, but we have the capacity to create machines that can go forward in time, that can very accurately predict what we will be doing in the next days, weeks, and months. And this is where I think we get to some really interesting questions about subjectivity and time and self-knowledge. Thank you. Um, okay, so what do you think about this idea of uh, having this mass optimization sort of govern the way that we live our lives? Uh, what is that, how, do, what is that uh, how does that bring tension to this idea that you brought up that we have a, a relationship between the self and the state and this relationship gives rise to the ethics uh, of what it means to be a self in a society and what values one espouses there? Look, I... Uh, what I was trying to do was just, uh, in some sense, engage a thought experiment uh, of what might privacy look like if we didn't think of it as a right. Because when we think of it as a right, we are immediately in that vortex where there are other rights. There are the rights of other people. There's First Amendment considerations, there are Fourth Amendment considerations, there are national security considerations. Uh, and for very, very good reasons, uh, once you're in that framework, uh, you make arguments for this or for that and this or that. Yeah. Uh, and not for a minute do I want to say, look, there's something completely wrong about that game. Okay. Not for a minute do I want to say this talk about the right of privacy is rubbish. Okay. But I do think that it is a right that is anchored in a particular, a particular value that we give to security. And it's a right that is anchored in a particular priority that we give to the unity of the state or the nation. And once one says, look, that's really not what I value, okay. then it seems to me privacy can look very, very different. You know? um, and I think with somebody like Gandhi, there's no question he valued something which we can recognize as a concern with the self. He valued uh, a particular form of being left alone. After all, that's, that was what the, the idea behind having a, a day of silence every week, that was the idea behind fasting. It was a form of deepening your relationship to the self. But there could be no such thing as a right to fasting, a right to silence. If you said to him, you know, is there a right to silence? He would have looked at you, you know, quizzically and said, I, I didn't speak about that. What I value is a form of privacy in which something like fasting or for him, fasting, celibacy, silence, you know, um, that thing, um, spinning wheel. You know, as he says, you know, what's the importance of the spinning wheel? Is it gives you a sense of the infinity of internal time. Whatever the hell that means, I don't know what it means, okay? But it suggests a very profound understanding of the value of something which for better or worse, we'll call privacy. But it could never be called, it could never be anchored in the right to privacy. Let me just say one thing in relation to that, because I, I think this is a fascinating debate 
around where we draw the boundaries of the self now. And I'm curious if the kind of leniency and the kind of welcoming mode of using technologies that in some ways extend our understanding of the self in an almost sort of McLuhan-esque way, that this has also produced a way in which, you know, where is that boundary? Where does that boundary of subjectivity live? That idea that the self was, was, was clearly known to you, you knew where it began and where it ended and where the next person began and where it ended, I think this starts to shift a little in these much more technological networked spaces where the self is connected to a whole range of both human and non-human networks, which we use in many ways to augment our own sort of selfhood and our own capacities. And this is where I think it gets very, very complicated indeed, because that also changes our sense of a, of a hermetically contained self, because we are connected into so many networks that move well beyond our understanding of, of the individual. And this is, again, where I think where we agree is this the limitation of the rights-based discourse, which is very much about an individual having a, an individual set of things that they can protect. What we certainly see in, in the work that I do around big data is that you as an individual data point is actually not that interesting. It's you in relation to an enormous aggregation of data. You are understood in these far greater collectivities of data. That's where meaning comes from. So again, we're thinking about these more collective, more aggregate forms, rather than these very individualistic forms that I think certainly privacy rights-based discourses have been far more used to. But let's throw to questions. I don't want to take too much more time from people. Questions to people? So anyone uh, would like um, in the back? Gentleman with the blazer. So, excuse me, my question is, what happens to the inner life when our thoughts are externalized through data aggregation and analysis and looking towards a hypothetical singularity? Is there privacy in such a situation? That's the $1 million question um, and an incredibly difficult one to answer, both from a technical perspective and I think from a philosophical perspective. And I love how this panel is, is really trying to span those, span those two. I think in many ways, this is exactly what I'm trying to point to, which is that because we share so much of the inner life with a set of systems which are networked to other systems which are aggregating that data for other purposes, sometimes completely against our own interests, that this idea of what happens to the internal life and the sense of self is actually getting, is getting very complicated. But you've raised the singularity, and that's, that's something that um, I tend to be very careful in thinking about because I, I worry that we use the singularity as a way of ignoring the very real concerns that we have right now about computation and privacy and security and ethics um, to think about this mythical time when, when computers will be absolutely sensate. And certainly in uh, the AI world, there are very real debates about soft versus hard AI, and we're doing a lot better in terms of soft AI than we are in terms of hard AI, which you might say is close to a singularity model. But even with soft AI, we have these entities that are eliciting so much data from us and, and are very emotionally connected to us. I think we have to ask that same question, but not posed in terms of the singularity, posed in terms of what happens to us when we trust these things that in many ways are back-ended to systems that we can never truly see or understand or track. That is a, a pretty extraordinary shift in a very short period of time. And, and to think about how we deal with that socially, I think is, is certainly the biggest challenge for researchers like myself. Um, right here up front. For Professor Mehta, um, I, I absolutely agree with you that privacy is not a right. We have a Fourth Amendment, a, a, a Bill of Rights, and that prohibits certain, it's about entering, you, you know, that sort of thing. But that is not what, what I don't think you mean, and it's not what I mean by privacy, and I don't think that is a right. But I wanted to ask you if you, if you think that giving up 
on the question of security is actually a condition of this deep privacy that you are uh, referring to. Thank you. That's a very thoughtful question. Um, I increasingly think the answer is yes, because I increasingly think uh, the notion of security has become so expansive uh, that and so fungible um, that it doesn't any longer constitute anything concrete. Um, it becomes, in effect, a reason of state. And so in Hobbes's day, or in Locke's day, security had a fairly discreet meaning. So national security meant the violation of one's borders. Today, there is no determinate, as far as I can see, there's no determinate conception of what national security means. You know, uh, you know, so the justification of me having to, I don't know, take off half my clothes every time I go through uh, 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 airport security is at some level national security. For me, that's too expansive a definition. Uh, I, I also think uh, that for somebody like Gandhi, and here I'm speaking on behalf of Gandhi and not, you know, uh, I, I, I don't want to suggest that these are views that I'm entirely comfortable with, but I, I do think he felt that the idea of security or or wanting to be safe was in some sense uh, an idea he associated with cowards. Cowards. He thought of it as a cowardly idea. Um, and he thought of the sort of exploration of the self that he was interested in as something that could only be done by those who had courage. Okay. So he did think there was a certain antithetical relationship between what he thought of as the cowardice of wanting to seek security as a primary value, not just as one value, but as a kind of anchoring value, and the sort of depth he was interested in. That was what you just said gets to something I've been thinking about and listening to the two of you. Um, when you speak about the self, I'm captivated and I'm deeply um, moved by it and, it and it stimulates my own thoughts. I'm sorry to say when I hear the computer kind of talk about the self, I don't understand what it is. When you talk about a self that has no boundaries because you're interacting with machines. Um, I've been very struck by this, and I wonder when the people who are more technologically um, based, when they hear humanists speak, do they feel the same kind of alienation that I feel? That it's a kind of real split. I'm being very, uh, I mean, it's very, it's funny, but I mean it very seriously. That it feels like we're really occupying two different worlds. Um, and our languages, when you speak of an ethics of um, data, I have, I have no idea what that might look like. When I hear about ethics of what it's like to uh, be Aristotelian or um, to have an, a courage, a virtue, that I understand. And one other thing that was striking to me, um, so I spoke earlier about invasive journalism, the 19th century, there were many schools that emerged for journalism ethics and codes of ethics, which we can see what's happened. I mean, it didn't have much effect. If they're going to um, police themselves, it doesn't seem like a very good uh, system. And it's, it's, it's troubling to me, really, to hear, to have this, this panel so interesting. Because I'm sure for the people who are humanist-based, I'm, I'm assuming they're having a similar experience to mine. And to the people who are technologically based, perhaps they're having that same sense of alienation. I felt that way with the last panel, too. I felt I didn't know what the, not the, was it the, la, the one that was about, yeah, it was the last panel. 
Um, I didn't know where, where was the moral, the moral center of that, where the one about Snowden and about that, I understood where the moral center was. Anyway, I don't mean to go on, but I'm just curious about if people feel the same way I do, or am I the only insane person here? So I'm, I think this is actually a really core cool question, and I think it points to a very serious failure. Because if we cannot express and make that divide narrowed between a humanist conception of ethics, of the self, of responsibility to the other, and a more pluralistically, shall we say, social science plus computational science plus, I would even go so far as to say, uh, continental philosophical perception of the self, which I think is far different to that idea of a very unified self, then we have a very real problem. And this is why. Because at the moment, these technologies are accelerating at such a rate that trying to bring in the framework of ethics and trying to bring in the framework of what is our responsibility to others is so important right now. And I genuinely believe if we don't get this right, then these kinds of surveillance technologies, these kinds of data gathering technologies will proceed in ways that are, at the moment, they will be completely unhindered, but they will proceed in ways that we are unable to unwind. They will become such a core part of life. So I hear this concern, and I, and I have to say to you, we all need to be doing a lot better, particularly on the technology side, to show why you should care about these things and to show why these facets of concern, like an ethics of data, are actually core to making sure that people have any kind of protections at all in these kinds of spaces. Let me turn to the second point that you raised about journalistic ethics, because I really like this example. What we saw with the emergence of journalism as a profession was the realization that journalists had an enormous amount of power in shaping public discourse. I would say something very similar is happening right now with data scientists and computer scientists. They have an extraordinary amount of power in shaping not just public discourse, but the public platforms on which so many people engage, share their information, form their communities. Yet those professions don't have codes of ethics. And I, I somewhat disagree with you here. I actually think the code of ethics for journalists is very important. And it means, to some degree, at least, there is a shared sense of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And that has been very profound, certainly for the last 50 years. We don't have that in these technological spaces, and I think we urgently need it. Because at the moment, there is no sense of like direct regulation in a federal sense, and there's no very clear sense at a professional level around what is going too far, what is an unethical use of somebody's data, what are the things that could actually cause harm to entire communities. Until we get that right, I think we have an enormous risk. So bridging that communication gap, I think, is actually one of the most important things we should be doing. I'm sympathetic with your sense of alienation. Uh, and I, 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 I'll try and respond to what you said uh, by putting it uh, as a question to Kate. Um, look, for me, the question that's important is what is it that we are interested in when we are interested in the self? If what most worries us about the self is that all of our consumer preferences are being recorded, or everywhere that I go in a mall is being recorded, or these funny toys, you know, this Barbie and whoever, you know, knows, you know, you know whether my five-year-old daughter has drunk her milk or not. If that's, if that's what we are worried about, that that information is now going into some supercomputer, you know, in Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, and they can predict the next time my daughter will or will not drink her milk, that's a concern about a particular kind of self. I'm not sure that self, and that self may be very threatened by modern technology, but I think there is another self that we are not talking about, okay? uh, which in some sense is less threatened by this world, but which may still, but, but, but by not talking about it, we in an odd way devalue it. Here's what I have in mind. 
Cicero writes a famous and wonderful letter about why he likes going to his country estate. And roughly the reason is it allows him to contemplate nature and the infinite. Virginia Woolf says something very similar in a room of her own, of our own, of one's own. It is a self that is concerned with a certain kind of transcendence, infinity, etc. Now, that self, I'm sh I have a feeling, is in some sense less threatened by what you're talking about. And, but the danger, it seems to me, is we are beginning to forget that we are, in fact, beings who are capable of going to nature and thinking the infinite. What we are worried about is, well, somebody's got all this data on me. I I'm worried about it too, okay? It's not that I don't care about it. It's not that, you know. But it is a kind of different kind of self. So I think this is a fascinating question because I think this is exactly at the root of what we disagree about. And I would turn to Virginia Woolf and I would think about what a room of one's own was about. It was about that ability to have a space of autonomy, of agency, of privacy, where you could think your thoughts, you could produce your work, and you could have a sense of economic, and in many cases, uh, of intellectual independence. It is precisely that that is being threatened by these technologies that I'm talking about. It is precisely that sense of agency, autonomy, independence, and an ability to remove yourself from the network. That is exactly what we're losing. And if I could turn to Hannah Arendt, when she talks about the fact that there are many things that cannot withstand the implacable light of the public realm. We are shifting so many things that used to be part of that private domain into domains that are now tracked, analyzed, processed, and then used to sell us things, to market us things. This exchange is so profound that it cuts exactly to what Hannah Arendt was talking about in the constitution of what a public life meant versus a private life. I would suggest to you that these technologies actually threaten the idea of a private life as Arendt knew it, and certainly threaten the idea of a room of one's own as Virginia Woolf understood it. And I think it's much more than thinking about when your kids drink their milk. It's about how they think and see the world. And that information, I genuinely believe, should be adhered to them, to their families, and to the people who care about them, not to a set of technologies and to a set of states who do not necessarily have their best interests at heart. I'd like to add something to that. Um, so Ode, uh briefly pointed to you know, Hobbes and this idea of the self as you know, somebody who makes a social contract, somebody who has the agency to negotiate the terms of their living, right? And on the other hand, we're talking about phenomenological self. We're talking about self that's given. We're talking about self that's shaped by context, right? And when we have technologies that learn to decode behavioral patterns, that learn to suggest uh, optimized uh, trajectories of choice, then we have a situation in which intention uh, is being mediated before there is an opportunity for action. Um, and that is, that is, to me, uh, in agreement with Kate, uh, a huge destruction of what it means to be human and to act in public. So not only is it destroying an opportunity for privacy, it's destroying an opportunity for what Hannah Arendt would call natality, the, the opportunity to act and start something new, uh, something unpredicted. Another question? Can I, inter I ask one? Um, I was struck by um, uh, un I mean, so many unexpected confluences in these papers, which I'm very happy about. Um, Kate, you, you, you use that smart church technology, or, or I forget the name of it, ChurchX. Um, and one of the examples Uday gave was of Gandhi um, saying that he doesn't have a right to be private, but his but private life or internal life is, is between me and my creator. Um, and I think this goes to exactly the question that Uday and Kate were just, and, and, and Sabrina were just asking about. Um, 
are talking about, which is what happens to the relationship between me and my creator when people are watching me pray? Um, I mean, one of the things about praying uh, was often that you did it in a private home, or if you don't do it in a private home, you do it in a religious or holy place that has a certain secu uh, certain um, uh, religious and holiness to it. And, um, you know, Hannah Arendt did say things like, and here she just quoted Shakespeare, but, you know, there is no love if you speak the word, right? I mean, love changes in being put in public and being watched. And I guess I'm, I mean, I, I think that this question of the humanities and technology is exactly what we're trying here to bring together. I mean, that's the hope of, of the conference. Um, they are alienating to one another. But um, it does strike me that we have to take seriously uh, that if you pray knowing that you're being watched and knowing that your church may be watching you and knowing that how you pray may be used to sell you things or to uh, decide if you're going to get into the baseball game the next day, who knows, um, you know, your, your Christmas list, uh, it's going to affect your relationship with your creator. I don't see how it doesn't. And so I'm wondering... Um, you know, you, 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 in, in the last question, Uday, in the last answer, Uday, you said that, you know, there's sort of two separate selves and I'm not sure they're related. Um, I wonder if we can keep them apart anymore and how much we can. Roger, you, 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 you put your finger on an on, 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 on important question, an uh, important issue. Uh, I guess, um, well, first of all, just to reiterate, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm all for putting up more barriers hmm, to this world in which I'm being constantly surveyed and scrutinized and my preferences are known to them before I even know them, etc. I'm all for that, okay? Uh, so I should make that absolutely clear. What I'm just thinking aloud about is Gandhi has, it seems to me, a conception of the self uh, which is so maybe peculiar. Uh, yeah, and it is certainly at best, uh, uh, minimally, it is really very peculiar. Okay? Uh, but it is, what's interesting about that conception of the self is that uh, the self is responsible for itself. Okay? It has to create its own depth. It has to seek out silence. It has to do the weaving. It has to create... Uh, the self-discipline, the esquisses of self-understanding. And because it is responsible for itself, Gandhi, uh, in some sense, uh, is, in a sense, indifferent to what others do, whether others uh, come in or not. So he is indifferent to whether people walk into his bedroom. For him, that doesn't interfere with the sort of kind of self-searching he's interested in. He's indifferent to, um, and at the level of the state, of course, he's indifferent. He doesn't believe that the, the security of the state should be a high value. So he says the, security, the, the state has absolutely no grounds. I don't know, but I, I have a feeling he would say, uh, I don't like these censors, but it, it brings upon me a greater obligation to pray uh, in a more focused way. Perhaps the different way I would pose that question would be, would 
Gandhi's followers have joined him in the streets in mass protests if they knew that they were being recorded and it would impede their ability to get jobs, to get access to health care, to get schools for their children. That is, that is the far more serious concern here for me, which is less oriented around the self and actually more oriented around responsibility to the other. And it is precisely where I think the ethical is significant here. It is less than this focus on the self and the individualistic framing and much more about the relational. What is the relational aspect in terms of how does that shift with these kinds of large-scale tracking technologies? And I think certainly in the case of Gandhi, who had an extraordinary power to bring people into the streets to engage politically, that is precisely the democratic th yeah, threat but, that I think is most important here. But Kate, there I will say something. I mean, Gandhi is absolutely insistent that nobody join the movement unless, if they are doing it for instrumental reasons. He is absolutely insistent time and time again. The instructions he gives to people to join the Satyagraha movement are all internal. He says, if you're doing this because you want to get something out of it, don't join. If you're doing this out of fear, don't join. If you're doing this because you hate the British, don't join. Precisely. But if, if you are doing it because you genuinely have political feeling that this is important and you cannot express that feeling in public because it is going to harm your future potential or the future potential of your family, that is a very different calculus. Yes. And it is that calculus that I think we need to discuss in these kinds of contexts. That's the ethics of data that I think is important here. If we think it's acceptable to film people and record people at protests and to send them threatening text messages, then that, to me, is something that we have to be seriously weighing in terms of thinking about the democratic threat of these kinds of technologies. Um, question right up here. We okay. one from Ashkan. Ashkan. Ashkan, yeah. So going back to this um, frame of self and the earlier question of whether it's humanistic or technology, technolog technologistic, um, I kind of want to ask, and I, I, don't, I haven't fully articulated it, so work with me here, but um, this idea of uh, how we, you know, independent of the privacy issues of being observed and the data being used, and et cetera, just our decision making and the way we learn and the way we define ourselves and the way we make decisions, right? The way we seek information, the way we search for books and thoughts. Um, I often, as a thought experiment, um, ask who in the audience here, for example, the first time you came to this location, who you, how many of you used a map and how many of you used a mapping service, like an app or a navigation app? So, right, but now if you look at our generation or the newer generations, they would often re rely on a Google Maps or some sort of algorithmically driven tool that helps them find their, their, the things they want. The, you rely on, on it to filter your mail, email if you use email, you rely on it to filter um, uh, your news feeds if you use any social media, you rely on it to navigate a map. And the question, I think, the idea of self is how much do you know about that algorithm, how it's influencing you and how it's driving you? The, the thought experiment I always wonder is when you type in the location from your house to, this lo to, to the Bard Center, to the, to, 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 to the stadium, to the Bard uh, School, um, how do you know that that is the fastest, quickest, most optimal path based on traffic and distance? And how do you know whether the company that provides you that service might route you in front of a billboard that they want you to see. Do you know? Not that we say that happens, but do you have any idea what those biases are and um, how much of those are, are essentially those systems are reflecting your intents and your wants and how much of them are reflecting the wants of the people that want you to, to follow a direction or an outcome. And I think that's where this line of self and technology is blurring, right? And it's not the visible conscious decision, but it's the subtle kind of nudges that we experience every day based on what are the top hits in our search engine, what are the routes we follow. And I think that's the question that I th uh, is important between this humanistic and uh, technology-driven self. 
I think it's a beautiful point, Ashkan, and, and thank you for making it. I, I think also, just a quick thing I'd add is, how do we nourish the self? I mean, if we think about the self as, as something that is, is given to us upon birth, how do we nourish it? What, what are its inputs? And for many of us, it's books, it's going to, to galleries, it's going to libraries, it's engagement with knowledge and with different forms of cultural production. All of these sites which used to be something that we'd have quite an intimate relationship with. It'd be you in a book or you looking at a work of art. These are now sites of extraordinary levels of data mining and analysis. So we're starting to see that on Kindle, not only does a set of companies know what you're reading, but they know exactly up to the page and line that you're reading. They know how fast you're reading. They know the things that you're spending more time considering. That gives a pretty extraordinary input into the, the kinds of things that are most important to you. Now we're starting to see major museums install huge eye beacon infrastructures so we can analyze what artwork you're looking at and thinking about. And, and things that are less popular will be moved to you know, the basement of the museum. I mean, to me, these are, these are problematic, not just because of the fact that they represent a particular type of mining infrastructure, but because they cut to what we understand about the things that nourish the self and the things that nourish our connection to others, that create a sense of community and a sense of civic space. That's where I think most of all these kinds of technologies need to be brought into contact with those conversations in the more humanistic disciplines, where I think there is a sense of value in books, in art, in protest, because these are the things that in some ways now have become terrains of contestation. <laughs>